All right. Hey, today's a great celebration for a couple reasons. Number one, number one is because we're going to honor somebody who is faithful and has served in our church and is one of those heroes of the faith. During these 50 days, for, during the seven Sundays, we're honoring a person or a couple. Today, we're honoring a couple. They've taught our middle school kids. They've uh, helped out with our, our young adults. Whenever we say, hey, listen, we need some help for this, they're the ones that are the first ones standing in line. They always want to help out. They're a part of our missions organization. In fact, in December, every year we, we collect gifts, and you guys are so generous about this. There's an orphanage that we uh, help support down in Aramacillo, Mexico, and uh, this couple, are, they don't just, like, help with it. They're the ones that organize it, and if you think it's easy, I'm telling you, there's always, it is so tough to get as many gifts and as much stuff as we take down to their orphanage. It's hard to get across the border, and so I want you to give a huge OVCN welcome to two people that are heroes of the faith at our church. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand and clap for them? Jaime and Monica Duran. Come on down here, guys. We love you guys. Thank you very much. We love you guys, and, and I know it's really hard. You, you, uh, in the first service, it was humbling, I know, but this service, Jaime, you just kind of turned and didn't want to even look at anybody because it was so humbling. But we want to we want to highlight you guys and lift you guys up and say thank you so much for being being open to be used by God. God has made a difference in your ministry uh, to so many people. I think of those kids down at Aramacia and uh, how we go to them and help them out. But you guys are the ones that take those huge steps of faith and get everything organized and make it so easy for us to go. So thank you so much. I want to give you this statue. It's by Scott Stearman. And it is, I want it back for the next service though, okay? I just, <laughs> <laughs> but we just want you to know in giving you this statue, uh, it's of Jesus uh, getting ready to wash the disciples' feet and dry them. And we want you to know as Jesus served his disciples, we know that you're serving us and helping us, and we want to honor you today. Thank you so much. We love you guys. God bless you. You guys are great. And then it was about five years ago that Dr. Deal came and spoke at our congregation, spoke to our church family. He's, he's, he's my favorite speaker in the Church of the Nazarene. He is absolutely awesome because when he talks, he communicates. And some speakers can get points across but when they communicate, it just does something to your heart. And I promise you that as you hear Dr. Deal today, that there, is, there will be something in your heart that grabs hold of what he has to say. He has an incredible message this morning. And I want you to give one of those huge OVCN welcomes also. You don't have to stand up, but I want you to clap really loud for Dr. Jim Deal. God bless you, Dr. Deal. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> Well, thank you. I'm not <clears throat> used to getting that kind of an introduction. So I am, though, blessed to be here in Tucson. Um, I had a half a dozen or however many ask me earlier on, uh, where do you live? Well, I live in the city that has 300 days of sunshine a year, Denver. <laughs> Except yesterday, we had a snowstorm. And I was at the airport. I had the wonderful blessing of being in the plane, in the seat, for two hours before they could get to the runway. It's what's called de-icing. It was such a blessing to... Uh, <laughs> I had to finally tell everybody, just let's all take hands and sing the doxology. Praise God. We're stuck on the runway. So anyway... Uh, if you've been around Denver, you know it, it, it's a great place, but we do have winter once in a while. So good to see you again here from whenever it was, four or five years ago, and I am proud of your church and your growth and this parking problem. <laughs> there are, are 5,598 churches that would trade you problems and say, let's have your problem of too many cars. We have a problem of too few. So uh, thank God for your growth and um, 
go over wherever that is and ride the shuttle in. Hey, that, that, that's whatever you have to do, keep it going here. Well, I, and I, I, am a, I am a fan, I am a cheerleader, is it all right to say that, of your pastor, Craig. He is one wonderful brother, and if I lived within a hundred miles of here, this is where I'd be coming to church, but it is a little far from Denver, but anyway, uh, you are blessed, and thank the Lord. Well, I feel led to go to Philippians this morning. It will be chapter 4. I know that as a young preacher, I know I would have said, let's turn to the book of Philippians. It's over there, you know, in the middle of the New Testament. And chapter 4, but I, uh, it is not a book. It's a letter. I know we say the books of the Bible, and I understand that. But this is a letter from a man, Paul, who was the leader of the early church, of the New Testament church, to a uh, church, to a bunch of believers over in a town or city named Philippi, and that's why we call it Philippians. Uh, Paul was, um, you know about him, I'm sure, he was everything to the early church. He was the theologian, uh, he was the missionary, uh, he was the, uh, the, the writer, the encourager. He also wrote the letters trying to straighten out some churches, such as Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Uh, if you're ever in a Bible study and somebody says, I just pray God will help us that we might become like that Corinthian church. They've never read the Bible. <laughs> uh, you don't want to be like that church. So uh, that's where Paul had to try to help them. And now here he is in prison again, not because he was a criminal, but because he was the leader of the band of Christians. Brother, it was not a popular thing in that day. So back into another prison, beat him up, I'm sure. He was chained down because he mentions that earlier on. And, and what it doesn't say here, but the scholars tell us, he had been in this prison two years, so we've got to factor that in, two years, and he hadn't done anything wrong except be a Christian, just like what we're talking about here today. And I just, I just want you for a moment here to understand their culture was not, was not very joyous. Just remember, they were being ruled by the iron hand of Rome. Well, there was no love lost there. Uh, you remember how the Roman soldiers treated Jesus, the cross, and all of that. Well, all of that, that's the, the Roman iron hand. Then we factor also in the fact that Paul was in prison. I don't think that was a happy, joyous place. I don't think they had air conditioning yet. I think there were rats and roaches in there, probably. And it's worse, but he didn't talk about it, but that would be a negative. And then the churches that he was responsible for, all of them, they, they, they had divisions, they had problems. Just, just to put this in your mind and think about it later, the early church was made up of people who had been Jewish all of their lives or Gentiles all of their lives and now thrown together in the same bunch and it was not automatic that they got along. Mm, amen. Uh, that, would, that would sure be fun to preach on some Sunday. And then find, well, no, I better get off of that right away. We'll just leave that one with, with Paul. And this church had a problem in that regard, and he had to say something about it. But I want you to see that he was not out here 
out here in Hawaii somewhere uh, enjoying the weather and said, let me tell you now how you can have peace. He was in a prison. The Roman guard was looking at him. It was every, everything dark about it. Now look what he said in Philippians 4 and verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, my translation is, and the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds better than this Roman guard's looking at me right now. Because he was looking at a guard, I am sure. I'm sure that's why that all came out that way. The peace of God. Could I just tell you today, in the middle of, um, of a dark culture, they could still live in peace. I want you to know what you already know. We don't have much peace either. There's not much peace in America. There's not very much peace in the world. And without taking the whole message to tell you all of the hot spots and all of the, all of the wars and all of the hatred, and uh, right here in America, we're seeing things that, that I have never seen uh, in the political world. Brother. Man, everybody hates everybody, don't they? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, I'm sure not going to get into that. Or I'll kill the service in about two minutes. But, oh, boy, I mean, they'll, uh, they'll fight you over a nickel. <laughs> well, anyway, I better keep, keep going here. And on top of everything else, the stock market went down in the tank this week. So everybody that's living with some kind of a response on the stock market with your savings or your retirement, well, we all ought to sing the doxology. Praise God, all blessings, I am now broke. <laughs> Amen. That's not too exaggerated in some cases. I want you to hear me say today, God has peace for you and for me no matter what's going on. And he said here, and the peace of God, it's beyond our understanding, but it'll guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I didn't know, I didn't know for a long time that he started speaking about peace up in verse 4. It ought to, it ought to say right there, now Paul is going to tell the church how to live in peace. But it doesn't say that. He just starts in. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I will say rejoice. I, I, I know maybe we preachers shouldn't say this, but that's easier to preach than it is to live. Hmm. Rejoice in the Lord always. Always, and again, rejoice. Huh. <laughs> I don't think we are born rejoicing. I think we are born griping. <laughs> mm. If you don't think so, get married and have some children. <laughs> <laughs> I want Donna's bickers. You don't get Donna's bickers. Ah. Oh, I'm not making that up, but I'm not telling you that whole story. Donna's my sister, and I'm doing the yelling. When I was preaching on how, how much God can do for us somewhere, someday my mom heard me, and she said, Jim, you weren't born sanctified. <laughs> you weren't even born saved. That's for sure. But we've had, I've had to learn. I've had to learn through Christ Jesus how to rejoice when I didn't feel like it. Amen. Learn to rejoice. I, the main lesson, God has given me a bunch of them, but the main lesson, I think, was my uh, second pastorate. 
Uh, I've already met more than, more than a half dozen, maybe a dozen of you that, that are from that wonderful state of Iowa. So, amen. So I got another amen. I was there in Iowa and someplace I clearly know, but I won't say the town because he's probably related since Nazarenes are related to Nazarenes everywhere. And I was there and I was trying to do what a shepherd does, a pastor. I was out with the people and in the afternoon was there, was over there, stopped there, stopped in to see how they're doing and so on. And I was coming back home toward five o'clock and came into this subdivision where we, Parsonage was on down and uh, one of the church families lived there. I said, well, I'll just stop in and a couple of minutes and, uh, and the, the dear brother the dear brother was born under the dark of the moon. I mean, when he was born, the chickens all plopped over and died. Because, and he just, he, he's just so negative. And he, his face was even built kind of negative. And if he'd say, God bless you, it'd make you mad. <laughs> but he never said, God bless you. And uh, I stopped in and he started in in his negative way and and, and, and griping about this, and then he's turned on me, and that's always a real blessing. <laughs> and, and I, uh, I, I, I just didn't like it, uh, you know. Well, sure, beat on me, just beat on me a while. Hey, I, that's good. Just tear me up, man. I like that. If so, you're crazy. But anyway, I got out of there and got in the car, and I said in that shibby, Lord. Get me out of this town. Get me out of this church. I don't have enough time to spend with people. I've been I with people all day trying to help folks. And the last thing I get is to get chewed out, spit out, and, and, and I don't, I'm not going to tell you what he said, but anyway, bad stuff. And I heard, I heard a thought in my mind, it had to be the Lord at the curve in that subdivision. I can see it right now. I was in that car. I was not real blessed. I heard these words. How long are you going to let your joy be dependent on how he acts? I said, oh, oh I don't think I'm smart enough to think that up. <laughs> that must have been you, Lord. How long are you going to be, are you going to let your joy to be dependent on him? And I pulled in the drive, I put the car in park, turned the thing off, and I said, Lord, I, I'm not rejoicing right now. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to try before I go in the house. Uh, <laughs> I was not in much of a mood to say, hello, honey, how are you doing? God bless you. Everybody happy, because I wasn't very happy. So I said uh, out loud, Okay, Lord, I want to rejoice. At least you love me, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's a beginning. Then I said, well, Lord, thank you. At least you don't chew me out, spit me out, beat me up. You actually love me. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm making progress. Then I thought of one more. <laughs> <laughs> Been smiling on this one ever since. Lord, thank you. I'm so glad that I'm not married to him. <laughs> amen. Amen. If you are married to him, <laughs> come back next Sunday. Pastor will preach on what to do with a, living with a booger man. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I am actually trying to tell you I had to learn to rejoice. Are you, are you with me? I had to learn to rejoice when I didn't feel like it. I was rather young then. Little did I know what was ahead. Little do we know. But I want you to know, young and old, if we will learn to rejoice, sometimes through our tears, it's connected to peace in your heart. Amen. That's connected. By the way, the opposite is just as true. The murmuring, the griping, the, the hurting, talk, cutting, that also is connected to your 
heart, your attitude. Well, and actually, the next verse, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Another translation says, let your graciousness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. The easiest definition for graciousness is treat others with grace. With grace. With, we, we ought, we're, if we're Christians, we ought to be nice to people. Amen. Even at the hotel, even at the restaurant, even at the gas station, even at the school. If we're Christians, we ought to be we ought to be Christian all the time. Now, I'd, I'm not trying to say that we just stand around and grin all the time. But, but we can be Christ-like to people. That's, re, that's connected to peace or joy, because I think they are, they are t- connected. That, that's all tied in with how we live. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Uh, you've got me in this motel out here, wherever, wherever it is. And I went down this morning to um, uh, actually get a little change so that I could leave a little tip for the housekeepers because we have a son in the hotel business. And he tells me, you ought to leave him a little tip, Dad. Don't, you know, remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, so I do. So I was going down to get a little, uh, get some ones. And this fellow was there and He was looking pretty uh, irritated, and then he walked outside and looked a little more irritated, and I I just followed him out. Are you here, brother? I hope the old boy didn't come to church here, but anyway, uh, (laughs) just had that thought hit my head. And I just walked out. I was just trying to be nice to him, and I said, uh, Hey, uh, how you doing? How you doing, old buddy? He said. He said I'm not doing good. He said that this is a no good day. Well, um, God bless you. Smile. <laughs> I'm sure everything's going to be all right. But he wasn't in any mood to talk. I don't know what the problem was, and uh, he went his way. I went mine, and I don't know his story, but I want you to know. Jesus can still give you peace. Amen. I didn't have time to tell him because he didn't want to hear. He walked away. That's okay. I want you, to, unless he came, and God bless you, brother. <laughs> you're, you're, I'll, I'll talk to you later. But anyway, rejoice in the Lord. Learn to rejoice. Be gracious with people. Is there an amen? Amen. Amen. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Okay, let's take that again. We don't speak that way too well in America now. Be anxious for nothing. Here's the way we say it. Quit worrying. Quit worrying about everything. Come on now. Quit worrying. Give it to God. Give it to God. Amen? Amen. Quit worrying. I, uh, I was a pastor for 22 years and a district superintendent for 10 and others, whatever else I've done. And I've listened to a lot of people unload their heart, which is a part of it, and especially the last church, which was Denver First Church. And I, when I first went there, evidently, Everybody wanted me to hear their story. And they were not all happy stories. And man, it got bad enough that it was like a doctor's office. Okay, your three o'clock appointment here. Get them out of here. Comes a four o'clock appointment. And uh, they weren't all there blessing the Lord, I'm telling you. And <laughs> so I started to detect a little bit of a pattern. A lot, a lot of people are upset or worried or, or just, just uh, intense about the past. The past. And I refer to that now as, if only, if only, 
and, and, and I'm not making this up. This, this was right there in, in the pastor's office, and uh, this brother was sitting there, and he was some kind of upset at his wife, and she was not there. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, he was saying, oh, whatever. And he said, if only I could have married your wife and you could have married my wife, life would have been better for me. I said, God bless you, brother. We don't do that around here. <laughs> I couldn't believe the old boy would say that. And then a few months later, whenever it was, there was a mom and a dad there, and they were some kind of upset at their kids. They said the same thing. They don't even know each other. If I could have had your kids and you could have had my kids, life would have been better for us. I said, we don't do that either around here. We're not switching kids. If only, if only I would have, if only I would if only I would have never gone there in the first place. If only I'd have never started that. If only, if only. Do you know what I'm saying? We can't change the past. Amen. And I keep pointing to the altars. That's just kind of Nazarene talk for... These are great places to pray and to give things to God. Don't drag your past on and on and on with guilt or accusations or whatever. If it's under the blood of Jesus, get up and get going. Amen. If only let the blood of Jesus wash it away and make the rest of your life count. Amen. Oh, man. Oh, 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 oh. And, and then um, the other uh, seems to be, uh, what if? What if? Oh, what, what if this, ha what, if our, what, what if our government uh, caves in? What if the financial system goes broke? What if Social Security dies? Well, what are we going to do? Well, what if my kids do that? Well, what if that? What if you can lose the peace playing the what if game? Amen. What if? What if? Well, let's all get nervous now. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Well, what if this bump in my neck right here? Well, what, what if it's cancer? It isn't. Well, what if it is? It won't get better. It, 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 it's, it's ugly. Uh, but it isn't. Yeah, but what if? And then if you're married to a lady named Dorothy like I am, Jim, get to the doctor. No, honey. There's nothing wrong. This is just what happens when you turn 50. <laughs> There ought to be one amen in the house. <laughs> I'm making up some of that other stuff, you know, about what if, the, but I'm not making that up. That was me. That was a few years ago. I finally did go to the doctor <laughs> at her insistence, and the biopsy did not understand at all what it was. Then to a specialist by the name of Dr. Seth Reiner, Littleton, Colorado. I live in Lakewood, Colorado. One street away from Littleton. Ah, oh, you have a hurtful cell tumor, he said. I said, well, what do we do with it? We get it out is what we do. And I said, well, doc, tell me about it. He said, I've never seen one. <laughs> I said, doc, you're the specialist. What does that make me? He said, what? you're what we call a guinea pig, man. Well, well, praise God, I'm so happy. I have something that you, don't, that you have not seen. And uh, so, okay, he'll let me go through December. And uh, then the 1st of January, Porter Hospital. No, 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 doctor, please, please don't fall out with me here. I have to go to, um, uh, I have to, go to Australia. And, and this is, this is what I, my work with the church. Then I have to go over to New Zealand. And then we had to fly back and we had to get up into Indonesia. And then I remember getting into Mil uh, Manila, the Philippines, and it's a whole month. And I said, please, doctor, it's been there for a long time. Uh, let me have one more month. 
and he got pretty straight with me, and he said, when do you get back? January 30. January 31, Porter Hospital. Meet me there, son. And so I did. And it was five and a half hour surgery. And they took all this tumor out, which is way, way more than I want to talk about today. And we went back to get the stitches out. And the two chairs there and the doctor's chair there. And he looked pretty, pretty stern to me. And he said, it was full of aggressive cancer. And you have a problem, young man. He always called me young man. I kind of like that. <laughs> but he scared me. Cancer. He said, I have to do it over again. I said, no, 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 you already did it. He said, I have to go back. He said, now we, it came from the thyroid. Now we've got to go get that. And I don't know what else I have to get. And I'm, I, I, this is what he said. You will have to sign the waiver. You probably won't have a voice when I get done with you. Or it may be real gravelly. Or it will cut in and out. But I'll try to keep you alive. Well, praise God. If you can't talk, how can you preach? And uh, he scared me that day. Then he said something I want you to hear. He was a Jewish surgeon. You can tell by his name, Seth Reiner. He said, it's about time for you to get 5,000 of those Nazarene friends of yours to pray for you. That's where you are brother, when the Jewish brother says it's time for prayer, I think we ought to go to prayer. <laughs> and uh, some of you heard about it, and some of you prayed. And all I want to say about that is I went back at the, at the end of the month, and they cut me open. I don't have any thyroid. And I have to take synth synthetic thyroid, which is Synthroid, every day of my life. And went back, and I was waiting now to hear a good report because the folks have been praying, especially in San Antonio two weeks before where I had been. And they had gathered around and prayed for me. And he didn't look very happy. And uh, he, I, I said, well, what's the report? What's the report? He said, I have been to pathology myself. I have been to the lab myself. I've dissected that thing myself. I can't find any cancer anywhere. And I said, well... Why are you so aggravated? He said, because it was there, and now I can't find it. I said, doctor, now I know. Two weeks ago, San Antonio, uh, they, gathered, they gathered around me. They, they went to prayer for me. I knew God did something for me, and now I know the Lord healed me. The Lord healed me, man. The Lord healed me two weeks ago, and I, I, I have great respect for him. I hope you can hear me say that. I have great respect. He said to me, we'll see you know, I can't take my word for it. They put me through that radioactive iodine-131 stuff. I was so radioactive, they put me in isolation for 30 hours. I was radioactive. I bought the newspaper and read it all night. Didn't even turn the light on, you know. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I'm messing with you just a little bit there. I need to tell you, I, you need to know the way that I'm going to finish here. The Lord healed me. The Lord healed me. Oh, and thank the Lord I can still talk. Uh, thank you, Jesus. But, however, quit worrying. Quit worrying. Give it to God in prayer. Give it, commit it to Christ right there. Give it to God. And then the peace of God do you, do you follow what he said there? I mean, this is something. It's right in the book. Learn to rejoice. Be gracious to people. Quit worrying about it. Give it to God. Give it to God. And I'll give you peace. Brothers and sisters <laughs> and teenagers and all, I guess that'd be a pretty good time to quit. And to say, blessed be the Lord. But 
we have four kids. Jody, Jim, Don, Dave, and our youngest, Dave, who was Craig's roommate in college. That's why it tears me up to tell this story in front of you. You lived with him for four years. Dave was the executive pastor of our First Nazarene Church in Colorado Springs. It's called melanoma cancer, and it got a hold of our boy. And he became thinner and thinner and more and more hollow in his eyes. I live in Denver. I told you that. He lived in the springs. He would call me, Dad, when are you coming home, man? I'll be home a Sunday night. When do you leave? Wednesday. We got to meet. We got, we got to talk, Dad, and get Mom. And so Mom, Dorothy, and I would go halfway, Castle Rock, Colorado, to Duke's, his favorite little restaurant. He'd bring Lori and the little girls. And I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it here, but I watched my boy die for two years. And I would say, Dave, God healed me. You know God healed me. God's going to heal you. The Lord healed me in my throat. Come on, Dave. I need to just go ahead and tell you this morning, Dave died. Our, my boy died on June 23rd. I was overwhelmed. Lord, I thought you were going to heal him. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I've been a pastor. I've already mentioned that. I've conducted more funerals than I can count. But I've never conducted the funeral of one of my own kids. And that's just beyond and when I was following the casket out of Denver First Church, because we had the funeral in his church, and then they brought it up, wanted to do it again in our church where I was pastor. And we were going out. The devil, the devil will jump on you at the worst time in the world when your heart's about broken. And the devil put this thought in my head. Why did God heal you? Why didn't God heal your boy? I said, I don't know, Lord. Why did you heal me? Why didn't you heal Dave? And of course, we had to get on and go and cemetery and, and you push all that out of your mind. But nighttime comes and you start to remember everything at night. And that started echoing in my mind. And I'd get up and preach and try to help people. And I'd get back to the motel. Why did God heal you? Why didn't God heal your boy? And I just need to tell you today, the devil was stealing my joy. He was stealing my peace. Can you understand that? And I was about up two, three months after the death. After the funeral, I was in some church, and the sanctuary was empty because it was the middle of the day. And I came in, and I was parading back and forth all by myself, about like I am now. Lord, why did you heal me? Why, did you, why didn't you save that for Dave? Lord God, let me go. I was a, a distressed dad. The Lord whispered to me, give Dave to me said, I did, Lord, when we dedicated him, give him to me. And I went out in the, in the uh, parking lot, got my uh, rental car, and I got my Bible, and I've got everybody's picture in here. And I've got Dave and Lori. I came back all by myself, and I laid it on the altar. And I obviously was weeping because I missed that kid. And I said, Lord, 
I will not ask why, why, why until I die. I give him to you, Jesus. And I had to give my boy to God. He'd been in heaven three months, but I was still dying. And I dried my tears, and I picked up my picture. I put it in my Bible, and the Spirit whispered in my mind, Dave didn't die. I said, Lord, go out to Crown Hill Cemetery and look. Dave didn't die. He just changed his address <laughs> from Colorado Springs to heaven. <laughs> and I said, oh, I, that's right, Lord. I keep forgetting. Dave's alive. Dave's more alive than I am. And I cried again. Picked up my Bible. I don't know if you'll believe me or not, but I'm not going to try to prove it to you. I'm just going to tell you. I walked out of that church in peace. <laughs> God gave me peace. And I miss him. You better believe. But the Lord has given me the promise that's in the word. There's a reunion day coming. And it's going to last forever. And the Lord has given me peace. Or I wouldn't be here preaching today. I would have dried up. So all I want to say to you this morning now as I, as I finish, Jesus can get you through anything. Amen. Anything. Anything. And give us peace. Give us joy. I just wonder, as I was praying for you in the night last night up in this motel hotel, the Lord seemed to impress me. There will be people there who have distressed hearts just like you have had. That doesn't mean you're not serving the Lord. I was serving the Lord, but I had a wounded heart. I just wonder if when we stand in a moment, if you would just come and stand by me and just let me pray for you. For the Lord to give you a brand new promise that you're going to make it through Jesus through Jesus amen through Jesus let's stand now just, just Lord Jesus Lord Jesus oh God Lord we want to rejoice and we want to be gracious and we we don't want to live Lord back in the if onlys and we don't want to live in the what ifs and all the rest of that. But oh God, right now, real time, we're in Tucson. And some people, Lord, are going through some battles and some dark spots. And the devil is saying something to them like, like he did to me. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus this morning. And we would pray that we might be able to pray with some folk that would say, I want to come and give this situation to Jesus. Would you do that as Connor sings just a verse or so? Would you just come right now and stand by me and we're just going to pray for you and then we'll go. And if you'll come, somebody else will take courage and come and God bless you. Come, just come. That's right. That's good. That's good. That's right. That's right. God bless you guys. That's good. for me. Good, 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 but you want to come, that's good, come on.